Hey everyone, thank you so much for watching the Cineform Renderthon. This was a great and fun little series that I did with Rio here where we built our own custom servers and had a blast doing so. And in these couple videos uploaded today, we will be giving our personal conclusions and overall thoughts on our experiences with the series. Now in the other video I uploaded today, we gave or Rio gave his conclusions and just overall thoughts on the series, on the process, on his server and what he's doing with his server. He actually has two now, so his server's now. And so if you missed that or you haven't seen it yet, go check out the YouTube card icon above or the description down below. And in this video, I'll be giving my conclusions. Cineform Renderthon, the transcoding build off server challenge between the guy or die and Epos Vox, where we try to build the best transcoding server for rendering our videos in Cineform for the cheapest price by eBay server parts. Thank you so much to Kingston for sponsoring this series by providing EposVox with his ECC memory, which keeps his build stable and secure throughout the entire rendering process. Visit the link in the description to learn more. So this was a fun little project. I didn't expect to go as hardcore with it as I did. I expected it to be a, a bare bones little thing that I used for one purpose and one purpose only. But when you have two powerful six core Xeons, and 32 gigabytes of ECC memory just sitting there waiting to be used. You can't just do one thing with it, especially if that's not something you're going to be doing all the time. And I learned that very quickly. My server, which you can't see, it's out of frame here, sitting right here. It is next to my main rig now. For a while it was over there on the other side of Choose, but it's sitting here ready to go to do a lot of stuff. So I use it to transcode files or generate proxies in the Cineform codec, which makes my editing timeline perform much smoother. Now the proxy capability was just added to Premiere Pro, which for a lot of users will eliminate the need to pre-transcode your footage. However, for me, it still doesn't fully solve the problem. So if I'm using the proxy system in Premiere Pro, and if you don't know about that, I will have a link to one of the official explanation videos up in the card icon above. It's a little bit of a high level technical explanation, but basically the proxy system generates temporary video file or video copies, then lower resolution and easier to edit in your project. And then you edit with those. And then when you go to render the final video, it uses the original files. Well, that's essentially what I emulate here by trans pre transcoding all of my files to Cineform is I'm creating easier to edit files and rendering those. But since those are lossless and they're in the same resolution, I get to edit those. But for a lot of people, the proxy system will eliminate the need for this. For me, it doesn't. So if I'm using the proxies, I will just simply set up the project on my server itself and allow it to generate the proxies and then open it back up on my main editing PC and edit there. Or if not, then I'm still just, I have a watch folder set up for Adobe Media Encoder and it just automatically picks up and transcodes all footage I put in there. So as soon as I finish shooting a video or whatever, I pop my SD card in there, copy the folders over and copy it over to the watch folder and it transcodes it for me and then I drag it back over to my main PC. For a while there, I even made a video back in like January or something. I was using a 10 gigabit ethernet connection with an SFP plus connector and a couple Mellanox 10 gigabit ethernet cards. I've since stopped using that because as many people pointed out by the speed test in my actual test video for this, I wasn't getting the full proper speeds to fully saturate the connection, nevertheless to saturate even a regular gigabit connection. So I finally optimized my switch a little bit more. So now everything's running through a big 18 port gigabit switch, which includes a couple of NAS drives, a brand new NAS server that I just got for review, which will sort of take some of the load off this server, this server, my rig, choose rig, and a bunch of other stuff, all running through a gigabit switch. And the speeds are quite nice nowadays. A big limiting factor that I ran into with this server is that it is outdated. And this is something Rio discussed as well, but the server parts are quite outdated, which is how we got them so cheap and how we were able to get them used and get them for much cheaper than you'd get normal consumer hardware. And the issues that come with that is compatibility with other devices. Uh, for example, there is no SATA 3 in the motherboard. It, it only has like two or four, I can't remember which, SATA 2, three gigabit per second ports, which means my already slow mechanical hard drives are gonna be a lot slower. I notice instantaneous speed boost by dropping in a SATA 3 card, but that uses up an expansion slot. It has no onboard audio, so I had to use a standard PCI sound card in order to get some audio features working and even some of the Adobe software wasn't wanting to work because there was no audio device whatsoever and it just kind of freaked out a little bit. I only have 32 gigabytes of RAM which is a lot that's the max that my main editing PC can even take and that's what I have in there as well 
but the board itself can handle up to like 192 gigabytes and the amount of rendering and other processes that I'm telling it to do uh, it creates a situation in which I could use more RAM but that is on me for not buying more RAM simply because I can't afford it not necessarily on the server itself but it is uh, it's an older build but I have it in the fractal design defined XLR2 case that is a long ass case name this is a computer case designed for specifically extra large boards. Now thankfully, unlike apparently Rio's situation, my motherboard was fairly well documented. Finding user manuals and size specifications and things like that was fairly straightforward. So I found that it was 12 inches by 13 inches. I sent an email to Fractal Design with my exact motherboard asking if it would fit in the case. Never heard back, <laughs> but I ended up just taking a risk and ordering it anyway. And it worked out pretty perfectly. I can't use some of the cable cutout grommets but that's okay, I don't need to, and I did need to buy a power extension cable for one of the four port, or four pin power connectors for the motherboard, but it worked out quite well. The Hyper 212 Evo coolers for the CPUs worked out wonderfully. They are keeping that thing super cool and super quiet. And I even bought some cool little heat spreaders for the RAM, which I can't use because the clearance with the coolers aren't there. So that was quite sad and a bit of a waste of money. So, for the purposes of my server, I did. I, I, we sent about the same amount of money. I'm not looking at it at the moment, but our performance comparisons are fairly similar. I'm performing slightly better in tasks that use a GPU because Rio's server ended up not using a GPU because of his lack of a proper PCI Express slot. Whereas I was able to slap my old GTX 660 graphics card in there and so my build performs a little bit better whenever GPU acceleration comes into play. So graphics rendering, OpenGL, Cinebench with graphics, and certain Adobe Media Encoder renders that use the graphics card. Otherwise, we perform almost exactly the same. We have very similar parts, very similar specs. He just has a different motherboard and a different case. And overall different intentions with his build moving forward. But I am quite happy with mine. The uses that I put it through, it is an automatic transcoder for all of my footage. I also use it to render out my videos as well. I get two licenses for Adobe CC 2015 through my student subscription that I have with Adobe. So one of them's on my editing rig and one of them's on the server. And I simply open up my projects. I have the, I have all of my main drives that my footage or my assets such as lower thirds, graphics, audio, things like that, mounted as the same drive letter as they are in my main rig on the server, which allows me to then just open up the project files and it automatically detects and loads all of the footage over the network because it sees the same drive letters and I don't have to tell it where to find the footage or anything like that. It loads it up perfectly since it's told to reference those drive letters. I do have an explanation an explanation of how to do this in my 10 gigabit ethernet video. Check the card icon above, I already talked about it, so link will be there. And then I tell it to render out my final videos as well. Technically, if I were rendering it from local disks on the server itself, it would be faster because local rendering is always going to be faster than network rendering. However, I don't have the capability to do that at the moment because I can't afford bigger storage. I have like three one terabyte drives in there, a 500 gig and a 750 gig in there. And I think I just threw a new two terabyte in there. So a very scattered and sporadic storage simply because I can't afford mass storage at the moment. So at the moment it's rendering over the network. It still renders in about the time it would take to render on my main computer. But the advantage here is while it's rendering or queuing up videos to transcode or render, I can keep editing on my main PC without any performance hit. Every once in a while there might be a disk read performance hit because it's reading all those files over the network to disk, but the actual read speed of the hard drive is going to be slower than the network transfer speed anyway, so I'm able to have it render footage or render on the server from my computer and keep editing and playing games or doing anything at all while rendering on my main editing rig with no performance impact, which is a big deal because on my build, which is also a bit of an older build now, it struggles to do literally anything at all while it's rendering in Adobe. And so this was a huge boon to my productivity on the whole. There have been many nights when I'm editing a ton of videos and just go ahead and tell it to render on the server, get them all queued up so I can just keep them uploading and immediately start editing again on the main computer. Works perfectly fine. The server also acts as a deluge server for all of my downloads. A J, I have J Downloader running on there for also downloads. It has, what else does it have? It has a lot going on it. 
is a it's going it's also a plex media server again i'm having hard drive storage issues at the moment so it's not fully functional as that just yet but i do have a qnap nas that i'm moving all of my footage archive and youtube archive to that way some of the hard drive space on the server can just be my plex media streaming so it'll transcode and stream media to all of the different computers and devices in my home which is pretty cool and it does just about whatever else i tell it to do the main function again is video editing so transcoding an ame or handbrake rendering from premiere or after effects and generally just uploading or transcoding videos and does an amazing job at it and I'm, I'm i'm hugely grateful that i took part in this process and as you'll hear rio talk about if you haven't watched the other video yet it, it was a bit of a learning process too i've built quite a few computers in my day and torn apart even more but dealing with a server is a little bit of a different ball game because there's a lot more particulars that you just have to abide by with consumer builds with normal computer builds you get to just kind of do whatever you want you can finagle things here you can Put a slot put a ram slot here instead of here with a server build you just kind of have to do it how it wants you to do it or you're going to have a hard time and i ran into that with a few different things so these have been my thoughts and conclusions on working with the server i'm sorry this series took so long to <laughs> put out here it's been almost a year since we built the damn things but it's been a great year using them like i said my productivity has skyrocketed since then and it's been a blast using it i've i've had a lot of fun and there's a lot more i can do with it now that i have a separate NAS unit storing some other media and things like that and if I have the opportunity I may build another in the future like I would love a full like 60 disk array server rack going with for actual uh, full formal like network storage drive and a couple other servers to do a few different things but for now I'm happy with what I have it was a great process my money was well spent you do have to learn your way around hunting used parts and server parts and again doing lots of research to make sure your parts are compatible but if this is something you want to get into and you already have experience hunting computer parts and building computers in the first place, I recommend it. I definitely don't recommend this as your first computer building project. Hope you enjoyed the video, guys. Hope you enjoyed the entire series. Again, if you have any feedback, let me know in the comment section down below. In case we do another series like this, smash the like button, get subscribed for more awesome tech videos. Go check out Rio's channel as well for more awesome tech videos as well. And I will catch you in the next video.